Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's public health conversation. To those who joined our morning session or yesterday's session, welcome back. This is the third and final session of our conversation about epidemiology and race. If you attended our first two sessions, you heard me thank our partners in putting this event together. I'd like to do so once more in recognition of all they have done to make this possible. Thank you to our event co-host, the Society for Epidemiologic Research. Thank you to our epidemiology department for their leadership in putting this event together. Particular thanks to department chair, Martha Werler, and to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel who make these events happen. And thank you to all our panelists who have enriched our understanding over the course of these sessions. We host these public health conversations to engage with the foundational issues that shape health. Few issues are more foundational than that of race and its influence on health and health inequities. We have explored this in the past two sessions. We are now going to conclude our series by looking ahead, asking, what are the big unanswered questions for epidemiology with respect to race? And how might working to answer them help guide the future of the field? It's now my great pr privilege to turn the screen over to Professor Martha Werler, our Chair of the Department of Epidemiology and the intellectual architect of this event, who is going to moderate the final session. Martha, over to you. Thank you for the intro, Dean Galea, and thank you panel members and attendees for joining part three of our discussion on epidemiology and race. What are the big unanswered questions? As moderator, I'll begin with introducing all four of our esteemed speakers. And after they've all spoken, we'll open it up for questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A box as opposed to the chat box. And if your question is directed to any one of our panelists specifically, please state that in your question. First, we will hear from Dr. Anjum Hajat. Dr. Hajat is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Washington School of Public Health. Her current research interests are social and environmental stress stressors that disproportionately impact disadvantaged populations. She has done research on stressors like psychosocial stresses, environmental exposures, occupational and economic factors in relation to health outcomes. We will then hear from Dr. John Jackson, an assistant professor in the departments of epidemiology, biostatistics, and mental health at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. His research primarily focuses on causal inference and developing methods to help identify, refine, and evaluate interventions to eliminate health and healthcare disparities and also developing methods to improve the transparency and conduct of observational studies and post hoc analyses of clinical trials. Third, we will turn to Dr. Arjuman Siddiqui. Dr. Siddiqui is division head and professor of epidemiology at University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health where she also holds the Canada Research Chair in Population Health Equity. Dr. Siddiqui's research interests are centered on health inequalities. She mainly works on understanding how and why health inequalities are so pervasive and persistent. Finally, we will hear from Dr. John Rich. Dr. Rich is professor at the Drexel University School of Public Health. He has been a leader in the field and his work is focused on serving one of the nation's most ignored and underserved populations, African-American men in urban settings. His recently published book about urban violence titled Wrong Place, Wrong Time, Trauma and Violence in the Lives of Young Black Men has drawn critical acclaim. So with no further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Hajat. Uh, 
Sorry about that. I'm just trying to get my slides up. Thank you for having me. Um, here we go. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so today I wanted to start off with a uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, so I am calling in from uh, slightly north of Seattle. The land I occupy today is a traditional home of the Coast Salish people, that is specifically the Snohomish and the Suquamish tribal nations. For those of you interested in land acknowledgements, there's a great website that I've posted at the bottom there uh, where you can learn more about the lands that you are occupying currently. So today I'm going to talk about revealing the unasked questions related to race. And I had three sort of points that I wanted to discuss. So first, I feel like in, it, to better understand these unasked questions, uh, we need to understand race itself a little better, uh, understanding the ethnicity uh, and population heterogeneity that we have in our nation, uh, as well as to better understand the exposures that accompany race. So I will focus my remarks primarily on race, but I do believe other speakers will talk a little bit more about structural racism. So the first thing we can do to shed light on unasked questions is to gain a better understanding of race. So uh, many measures of race um, are evaluating distinct but related concepts. And there's no single measure that is true or correct for any given individual. Uh, and the word race can be thought of really as a proxy for each of these measures. So the race theorist, uh, Wendy Roth, um, scholar, sociologist, uh, calls these domains, but I think of them more sort of as measurements. So I'm gonna show you a few of the measures that have been suggested in, in the literature. Uh, and just to note, this is not an exhaustive list and other terms have been used to describe these measures. So you, mo you may know them differently. So here are a few. Uh, the first one that we use most commonly, I believe, in epidemiologic uh, research is this racial self-classification. So just checking boxes on forms. But of course, there are other ways to measure race. There are uh, more open-ended approaches. There are uh, interviewer classified approaches where it can be um, observed at the beginning or at the end of an interaction with a participant. There are also reflected race. So this is the measure that was used, I believe, in, the, in Kamara Jones's uh, module of uh, reactions to race in the BRFSS uh, several years ago. And here we're asking the participant, what race do you believe others assume you to be? Uh, and lastly, here is uh, phenotypic race. So things like uh, skin color and other features. And this can be either self-reported or interviewer classified. Uh, there are also some objective measures, objective ways to do this. So what I don't include on this table because I don't believe it, it's a measure of race is genetic ancestry. So not to conflate those metrics, but of course one could use genetic ancestry measures uh, through sort of some sort of biomarker approach. So in epi studies, we most commonly use, again, just that racial self-classification. And many of these other measures are rarely used. I did actually recently see a paper by Jamie Slaughter AC looking at skin tone. Uh, the sociologists have been looking at skin tone actually for, for quite some time. Uh, but you know, it is thought that these different measures of race can produce different findings of inequality. And some measures may be more appropriate for evaluating specific health outcomes than others. Uh, for example, skin tone or observed or reflected race may actually be a better measure for perceived discrimination uh, than our regular approach. Uh, and also to note that uh, race identi racial identity can really change over time and is influenced by context. I think in epidemiology, we usually think about race as fixed, but specifically for um, multiracial populations, there can be some changing and flux in racial identity over time. So I think it might be important to evaluate um, uh, repeatedly the measures of race. Uh, and lastly, to note that some scholars have suggested that we measure race in more than one way in our studies. Uh, and this can yield you know, different insights that we may not have uh, been able to gain before. So the second idea about revealing the unasked questions that I uh, was thinking about is gaining a better understanding of ethnicity. And here I'm really just talking about disaggregation of data on race and ethnicity specifically. So I think as we all know that the absence of data can perpetuate and exacerbate poor health uh, and health disparities for small populations. That is the lack of data is masking health disparities and it's limiting our ability to uh, make data-driven decisions about resources and about policy. So in short, really data is power. And on the right-hand side, you see this graphic that sort of shows how inadequate data perpetuates inadequate data. It's be a bit of a cycle there. 
But there are, of course, some solutions to this problem of small, small numbers, which we, uh, you know, is a reality in epidemiologic studies. So scholars have suggested collecting in language data that is in the language of the population that you're interested in, uh, potentially creating specific ethnic uh, sampling frames or oversampling smaller populations. So the oversample of smaller populations has been done on some of our larger surveys, the BRFSS, for example, the HIS, the health interview survey. However, this is not a consistent approach to trying to better understand uh, smaller population groups. Uh, they tend to be sort of one-off approaches. We can also be standardizing data collection to better pool across data sets. So one way to get around small numbers is to use a couple different data sets. But the only way you can really do that is if uh, your race variables are standardized across. So using really broad categories like other or just multiracial without asking uh, which races uh, doesn't allow for any flexibility and won't allow for disaggregation. So collecting data on the smallest group really would be necessary. But fundamentally, what we need are changes to the surveillance system, to the public health surveillance system in our nation. Uh, our surveillance systems were constructed many years ago uh, by white populations for white populations. So really taking a good look at our surveillance systems to better understand how we can serve uh, the entirety of our population. And then lastly, there have been some successful advocacy um, efforts at both the state and institutional level. Uh, the state of California a few years ago passed a law indicating that the Department of Health had to collect data on many specific Asian and Pacific Islander subgroups. And I was recently informed that at the UW, we are going to start uh, collecting data on specific Native American tribes uh, in our student population to better serve them. Um, in, in terms of uh, small numbers, the, the other way around this really, of course, is to collapse uh, similar groups to each other. So when doing this, the question is, how, how do we do this and which groups do we collapse? So it has been recommended that we, th we use a community engaged research approach to do this and qual qualitative methods may help here. It's important to consider the historical, social and cultural factors when deciding how to combine groups. Uh, an example from uh, researchers actually at the University of Washington again, um, you know, had originally thought of just uh, merging native groups on, for example, on proximity. Uh, but through a community engaged process, they were able to reveal six or seven factors that were actually quite important to the community uh, that indicated a better way to combine uh, ethnic groups. Uh, and just to note that the, the specifically for Native Americans, the scarcity of data is harmful to these communities. A recent report by the Urban Indian Health Institute uh, talks about data scarcity as a form of data genocide. So really thinking about who benefits from the lack of data and what does the erasure of certain groups actually mean for them and for their health status. So the third idea and the last idea I have here is about better understanding exposures that accompany race. So uh, as we all know, race is not something we can intervene upon. So really thinking about what are these other social and physical environmental factors that might be better targets. Uh, so the exploration of multiple exposures, uh, racism, SES, psychosocial factors, environmental exposures, for example, and how they interact with biological factors is really needed to um, better fashion interventions. So here I think the concept of the exposome, which we can borrow from environmental health, is really useful. Uh, so the exposome represents cumulative environmental influences over the life course, uh, where we can look at several different domains, the physical domain, the social, the natural domains. Uh, and we can also borrow methods that have been being developed in environmental epidemiology to look at multiple exposures at one time. They think about these as mixtures, but you can really apply these to social uh, and other uh, exposures as well. Uh, but you know, what we're trying to do here are solve some complex problems with health disparities, right? And these complex problems require complex solutions. So identifying multi-level interventions may really help to improve uh, racial health equity. So moving away from simple individual level uh, interventions to thinking about how to also target communities and policies at the policy level. Uh, and here again, a need for community engagement can actually improve both the research and the intervention design. So just to leave you with the last thought on uh, knowledge democracy, which is something I've been thinking a fair amount about. So there are many questions left unasked because I think we just don't know to ask them. Uh, and I think some humility on the part of researchers and epidemiologists to understand that we have limits to our expertise and that it requires effective partnerships across disciplines and across uh, with communities.
Uh, and so community engaged research can really lead to knowledge democracy, uh, which is really just other ways of knowing so that we can solve these uh, more complex problems. So I'll stop there. Thank you all. Okay, thank you. And next up we have Dr. John Jackson. There you go. Um, uh, good afternoon, and I can't say how um, how much I'm honored to uh, be a part of the panel over the these few days. Uh, it's really brilliant minds and luminaries um, all coming together for discussion. Um, as my bio indicates, I'm based at, at Johns Hopkins uh, and I am a very honored to, slides aren't moving. Okay, I'm very honored to um, collaborate uh, with um, my colleagues at the Center for Health Equity, uh, which is led by Lisa Cooper and also the uh, Center for Health Disparity Solutions, which is led by Tom Labiz. Uh, and the reason why I am so, um, uh, I'd say proud and, and really value just uh, working there is uh, their focus on, on uh, interventions. Um, in particular, uh, 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 the Center for Health Equity does a lot of work on building multi-level, multi-component um, interventions in, in healthcare. And uh, in my own work, I'm asking how we can use observational data uh, and trial data to uh, build and adapt uh, these types of uh, interventions. Um, and so I've been um, ta uh, tasked with thinking about unanswered questions. And uh, as a methodologist, I'm going to approach it from a, a methodological perspective. Um, one thing I've been thinking about um, this past year, something uh, that's been underscored for me is how often we take certain things for granted when we uh, study disparity. And uh, by that, I mean how we talk about and how we measure racial difference or rather racial disparity. Um, as uh, many have argued in the literature, often we do so without thinking about implicit value judgments. And uh, I would posit that by ignoring uh, these ethical underpinnings, we often run the risk of uh, obscuring or inadequately capturing unjust uh, racial difference that must be acted upon. Uh, so equity value judgments have um, been discussed in the literature. There are discussions about whether outcomes should be measured in terms of gains, like uh, achieving hypertension control or shortfalls such as uh, uh, not achieving hypertension control, um, whether uh, outcomes should be measured on an absolute scale like a risk difference or uh, on a relative scale like a risk ratio. Uh, there are also discussions about whether a difference measure should somehow take into account uh, that, a, that, a, that a marginalized group uh, may be uh, much smaller or larger than, than, than a privileged group. Uh, there are also discussions about whether one should just try to summarize all the inequality in a population uh, rather than focus on a particular axis of structural disadvantage. Uh, all of these issues have been uh, debated and considered at length, but in my own uh, reading of the epidemiology and uh, medical literature on measuring disparity, I find much less discussion about what we actually adjust disparity measures for and what ethical uh, judgments uh, these choices impose or convey. Um, and I believe this issue of what is captured in a difference measure is just as important as these other aspects of measurement. Now, I wanna say, you know, oftentimes um, issues of uh, measurement seem uh, or can seem academic in normal times. Uh, but the last year, two examples uh, from uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, displayed for me how essential and fundamental they are um, and how important it is to get these issues right. Um, so one example comes to mind is when I was working with 
uh, colleagues to look at racial disparities in inpatient COVID-19 mortality. Uh, and in reviewing the published literature for comparison, many times I saw adjustments for uh, demographics like age and sex, um, pre-existing conditions, acute clinical presentation and socioeconomic status. Uh, thankfully, the authors uh, very often provided thoughtful context uh, about aspects of structural racism and were careful to avo avoid biological essentialism. Um, uh, however, um, sometimes in just measuring disparity, uh, though there was a focus on uh, whether or not there was a quote unquote independent uh, race signal, um, that is independent of demographics, independent of pre-existing conditions, and independent of clinical presentation. Um, and uh, from an equity perspective, I have to wonder what this independent race signal means. Um, if one believes that factors uh, like pre-existing comorbidity or socioeconomic status are the result of structural disadvantage, and more importantly, if we can develop and apply interventions to mitigate their effects, uh, then we don't want to adjust away these aspects of who people um, uh, are in their lived experience. Um, though, uh, though many of these studies uh, in the US found no differences in inpatient mortality, um, in many other areas of medicine, it's common to see a worse prognosis for uh, racial ethnic minorities. And yet in clinical studies to see uh, some of these differences adjusted way at the outset. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we uh, missing? Uh, another salient example comes from some uh, very talented doctoral students who astutely recognized that the CDC had uh, released mortality data with uh, weights that implicitly adjust the way of the effects of uh, where Blacks live. And um, this is concerning because, um, and, and this is concerning because Blacks often live where they do because of historical oppression, unjust housing markets, uh, federal policy, and uh, being constrained and segregated to certain areas of urban environments. Um, and this was the same place where the pandemic was raging in the early part of 2020s. Um, the CDC weights. Um, by weighting geographic locales according to death counts essentially made the, de the denominator for whites smaller, which in effect um, would, would attenuate a disparity. Implicitly, this uh, taking off the table imposes a position that differences in mortality at the national level, uh, differences due to geography and, and uh, by corollary residential segregation were not necessarily unfair and thus uh, should not be counted towards disparity. Um, but I would argue that differences in where blacks and whites live reflect on un, uh, unequal and unjust distribution and risk that should be counted towards disparity. In my own recent work, uh, which is in the current uh, issue of epidemiology in the context of uh, using decomposition analysis to identify targets for reducing disparity, I've proposed uh, that we explicitly define which sources of difference uh, we consider to be allowable and fair and, and to adjust for these when measuring disparity. And I also recommend that we uh, consider those differences that we uh, consider to be non allowable and unfair and not adjust for these when measuring disparity. Uh, these um, considerations have been discussed in the bioethics literature and also in the health services research literature. Uh, particularly for disparities in treatment, but are often overlooked when considering disparities in health. Uh, now, how we choose what is allowable versus non-allowable ultimately depends on what our uh, ethical assumptions or beliefs are. And I believe it's important to make these known uh, first to ourselves and uh, second to our, to our audience. Um, so in my paper, I discuss some um, guiding principles to help us think about how, um, how we choose what's allowable versus non-allowable, excuse me, like whether or not differences are modifiable, or even if they are non-modifiable, whether they might be addressed through um, intervention or should be. 
Um, other considerations may be whether there's a social contract at play or if the disparity of measure itself is used in a way that has behavioral effects on organizational practice, like for example, um, benchmarking and pay for performance. Um, now, uh, we may not always agree on what adjustments are allowable or not allowable, but by putting our cards on the table and uh, better yet by um, defending our positions or at least communicating our positions, it may help us improve our own studies as well as understand the position of others. Um, over the past 10 years or more in, in epidemiology, it's been commonplace to lay one's causal beliefs on the table through a causal diagram to lay out what one believes about how the world works. And this is advantageous because it invites productive scientific dialogue and focused critique that can improve studies. Um, so in a similar spirit, when studying racial disparities, I believe it's helpful to put one's ethical beliefs on the table by saying what sources of difference are allowable and non-allowable and why. And I believe that creating a, a culture like this, um, as much as we've done for guiding causal analyses, would help us pause before rotely adjusting away things that we typically do in exposure or risk factor studies without stopping to ask how those adjustments impact our results in ultimately medical and public health practice. Um, and again, uh, I know we, we, we have to move towards interventions, um, and, um, but I, I just also wanna say, I can't stress how much this past year alone has emphasized the importance of measurement. It sets the scope, the frame, uh, the yardstick, um, and if we can't get that right, it really um, impedes our, um, it, it impedes our, it, it impedes our ability to make progress. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very interesting presentation. And now um, we will move to our third speaker. And that is Dr. Arjuman Siddiqui. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with all of you. Let me share my screen. So I also am going to focus on uh, what I think is next in uh, racial health inequalities uh, research. And I just wanna sort of start with some premise and that premise is uh, well kind of articulated by the Williams and Muhammad uh, framework that's been set out. And if you look at their framework, which is probably familiar to many of you, they sort of suggest that there are these societal conditions and uh, a context of racism that influences um, people's uh, uh, sort of experience of life based on their racial category, their socioeconomic category, and so on. And that experience of life essentially uh, it has to do with the kind of prejudice and discrimination they face, the kinds of opportunities they have access to, the resources they have access to, and so on. And those things ultimately shape behaviors, psychological and physiological stress, and then health outcomes. And I would argue that in the last several decades, we've learned quite a lot about racial health inequalities. And if you think about it, uh, based on this framework, I would argue that most of our learnings have come in the area that I've uh, denoted by a, a red outlined square. And so I think we've learned a fair bit about how race of, is affected by processes like discrimination and how that uh, uh, sort of influences behaviors, it influences epigenetic processes and so on, and that ultimately then we see racial health disparities. But I would argue that we've done far less in terms of understanding the, the most left-hand side of this framework, um, which is a direct sort of exploration of some of those societal conditions and structural conditions that are uh, at play. And so I, the rest of my talk will really be about how we might go, go about understanding structural racism and how societal conditions have influenced racial health inequalities. And I think one way to understand this is to ask the question, how are racial health inequalities playing out in various societies? Um, what do racial health inequalities look like? What are their differences? Does, do the differences tell us something about how differences in societal conditions affect 
uh, racial health inequalities, but importantly also uh, how similar are racial health inequalities and does that tell us anything? Um, this is a, a paper that was done by my former doctoral student Chantel Ramraj and uh, a team of us um, in which we looked at black white health inequalities in Canada and the US. Um, as Dr. Jackson just pointed out, we adjusted for a lot of the uh, factors that we actually think are on the intervening pathway. And part of that is, is related to journal expectations, but I think he brings up a very good point indeed. In any case, uh, the blue bars are the uh, black white inequalities in health in the US, in the gray bars, black white health inequalities in Canada. And you can see that there are similarities and there are differences. So if you take, for instance, hypertension, you can see that the US has a larger disparity, black white disparity in hypertension uh, and Canada uh, has a smaller one, but it's still there. It's, it's, a, it's a small degree of difference. And I'm uh, wondering if going forward, what part of what we might be able to do is take these societal uh, similarities and differences in disparities and make something of what it is that societies are doing to uh, mitigate or exacerbate uh, uh, racial health inequalities. So uh, the second point I wanted to make is around measurement and what kinds of structures we could pursue. And this is an example of what we might consider an attempt to examine structural conditions in relation to racial health inequalities. This is a paper by Rodriguez and colleagues from 2014 in which they looked at trends in uh, infant health outcomes. This is infant mortality uh, over a period during which you had different uh, uh, presidential administrations. And they make an argument that during this, this period, you see a decline in infant mortality, but that the rate of the decline is different depending on Republican versus Democratic presidents. And what they are inferring in, in essence is that there's something about those presidential administrations that may lead to differences in conditions that uh, influence infant mortality. So that's one way we've gone about this. Um, this is a uh, study in which they looked at, this is by Liu and colleagues, and they looked at differences in forms of structural racism by examining inequities between blacks and whites in various social indicators. So they looked at the county level at differences, black white differences in who has a college degree or more, in who is unemployed, in who is incarcerated. And their argument is that the presence of a black white gap in these indicators uh, it directly speaks to structural racism. In other words, there has to be structural racism in order for these gaps to occur. And so one way to measure structural racism they're arguing is to look at black white differences in social indicators. This is a graph from a paper by Aaron Reeves and colleagues in which they looked at changes in suicide rates before compared to after the great recession of the sort of 2008-10 period. And basically they argue that there was an excess of 4,750 suicides in the United States as a result of the economic recession. And I think one thing that has kind of made its way deeper into the health inequalities literature, at least into the population health literature, is this lens of looking at specific economic and social policies, specific so social and economic moments. But what we haven't done a lot of is disaggregate how that uh, those policies and those moments uh, affects different social groups differently and, and in particular how it affects racial health inequalities differently. So this graph, for instance, tells me a lot about the effect of the recession on the overall population, but less about its effects on various social groups. Um, this is another example, this time a specific social policy uh, comparison. Uh, so in this paper uh, by Van Dam and colleagues, they looked at uh, what would happen if you increase the earned income tax credit versus increasing minimum wage. And they make this argument that minimum wage has uh, a larger effect uh, than uh, increasing uh, the earned income tax credit. 
uh, on health. And again, the issue is that's that's informative, but it doesn't tell us much about how this might affect social subgroups that are influenced by these policies. And that's somewhere I think we can go in the future. Then there are other uh, structural kind of uh, uh, issues that don't conform to this notion of specific policies or specific social and economic moments. This is, this is a set of graphs that show uh, what the black white disparities in income and wealth uh, look like over time. And I think we can make a strong argument that these are the kinds of phenomena, these income inequalities and wealth inequalities that are really influenced by a variety of structural conditions. And I think one thing we'll have to grapple with is how to study something that is uh, so related to multiple uh, factors. So the other, uh, and I guess the last sort of um, main category of, of uh, uh, sort of things to explore in the future that I think will be important is to move from static perspectives on racial health inequalities to more dynamic perspectives. How are things changing or not changing and why? So if you imagine looking at an overall d disparity in, uh, in uh, infant mortality by race, that belies a little bit a more complex picture, which is that infant mortality has declined over time, and there are reasons for those declines, and yet the disparities have remained largely the same. And a similar story could be told about uh, mortality uh, ratios between Blacks and Whites, and in fact, mortality ratios have, it have increased uh, in, in some cases. So even as mortality itself is declining, uh, the gap between blacks and whites fluctuates and in some cases is even increasing over time. And so the question is, what is causing this kind of, of, of secular trend? What is causing the ups and downs? What is causing the overall picture that we see in terms of disparities uh, between blacks and whites over time? And I, I think I'll just conclude by saying this, which is that in some ways we have a very tough job ahead of us. We need to know with some certainty what factors are involved in creating racial health disparities. Uh, and yet, um, often factors are very interrelated. So the very methods we use to isolate uh, and be sure that we're giving good, good sort of evidence on particular factors belies the fact, the fact that in reality, factors are very uh, interconnected. And I always come back to uh, graphs like this. This is from Toronto data. In 2005, uh, the Toronto Public Health Unit found that there were uh, income-based health inequalities, unsurprisingly, in a variety of health indicators. And they decided to uh, produce a bunch of programs to address these health inequalities. They started health education programs. They started giving uh, subway tokens so that people could readily uh, uh, attend those programs. Uh, all sorts of things that public health units uh, often engage in. And 10 years later, when they went to uh, remeasure health inequalities, they had in fact worsened, they had widened. And so this graph shows uh, outcomes for which going to the right are ones that worsened over time. So you can see most worsened, some stayed the same. Um, and so um, the story essentially that we think might be happening is that public health programs simply could not compensate for the fact that this was a period during which economic security uh, became much more uh, prominent. Uh, rents went up in Toronto, incomes declined, uh, so on and so forth. And that public health programs just simply couldn't compete with those kinds of social and economic forces. But that requires the telling of a complex tale. And the question is, how do we balance that with getting good empirical evidence on what's happening uh, and, and, and uh, what factors are at play? So that to me is, is a set of issues that I think we have to contend with in terms of understanding the societal dynamics at play uh, for health inequalities. And um, we've written a little bit about this. Uh, we've talked about the fact that we know uh, these conditions are, are, are bad for our health and that they interact. And yet it's a very difficult thing to put empirics to. And I think that's a tension here and I'll leave it at that.
Okay, thank you. And our fourth and final speaker in this session is Dr. John Rich. Thank you so much. I'm proud to be a part of this conversation and to be welcomed into this space. Um, I'm not an epidemiologist and I feel that this conversation is critical across public health as, as we begin to wrestle with important questions as we go forward. And so I just wanna thank uh, my fellow panelists for that really fascinating and deep discussion. And so just a few reflections on what I believe are important questions in this space that I'd like to discuss. And they are, how do we conceptualize uh, not just race and racism, but racial trauma? What would that mean as a way to think about how racism gets under the skin? Um, how we think about racism and what I would call transfers of advantage. And then finally, what methods might we use to achieve more intersectional um, research and conclusions? So I think there's generally agreement that race is not a biological factor, that race is proxying for other factors. The, the challenge here is that much of what we see and read and experience um, seems to hold that in some way, race is biological um, or cultural or behavioral, rather than focusing on racism as a primary cause. And we know that racism itself must function through some mechanism whereby it gets under the skin, um, affects the body's functioning and then intensifies the effects of the social determinants of health. So how do we think about that? And I, I, some might say, well, you know, haven't we moved past the point where some continue to view race as biological or reflecting a genetic frequency? But I can tell you that I regularly speak with medical students who tell me that race is rarely treated at all in medical school and medical education, other than to identify race itself as a genetic or biological risk factor. And so moving that conversation forward is critical. And so I, I and others have been talking uh, about racial trauma and it really goes back to the brilliant work of, of Dr. Chester Pierce, uh, a psychiatrist at Mass General Hospital who in the 70s first coined the term microaggressions, which he called subtle, stunning, and often automatic and nonverbal exchanges, which are, quote, put downs, unquote, for Blacks by offenders. And so this notion of microaggressions, while it has become somewhat politically charged, I would argue more recently, this notion that there is an accumulation of the experiences of racism, which mediate the biological effects is important and the American Psychological Association has recently identified and defined racial trauma as including these large scale workplace discrimination or hate crimes, but also this notion of everyday discrimination and microaggressions. And so one of the challenges is how do we begin to measure these more commonplace experiences and the degree to which they contribute to the underlying problems that result from racism, the health and public health problems. Uh, we have a colleague, Dr. Kenneth Hardy, a psychologist who's taken this on and thinking about what constitutes racial trauma as one potential framework. And he would argue that particularly for youth, racial trauma, the wounds of racial trauma include devaluation, um, an assaulted sense of self, an internalized voicelessness, and rage, which he distinguishes from anger. Now, this is just one framework which I offer to say that we can begin to define both qualitatively and quantitatively what racial trauma looks like for black and brown people and understanding not only um, how we incorporate those 
understandings into our research, but also look for ways to counter those wounds of racial trauma. A second point that I'd like to talk a little bit about relates to how we define and talk about racism. And I lean on Dr. Kamara Jones and her definition of racism. And as you'll see, she identifies racism as a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the phenotype race that unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and then saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. I think we often talk about the ways in which racism unfairly disadvantages black and brown people and communities, but we don't talk as much about how racism unfairly advantages other individuals and communities. And so, for example, when we look at data like these generated by Gelman, Fagan, and Kiss as part of the Stanford Open Policing Project, it's no surprise that if you look at the number of police stops for various different crimes and you look at that by, we look at that by race, um, the, the solid line being black people, the dashed line being Hispanic people, and the dotted line being white people, that even after controlling for precinct variability and race specific estimates of crime participation, there are these dramatic differences in police stops. But it's also makes sense that if the police are focusing their attention on black people, they are not focusing their attention on white people. And there is in a sense an advantage that accrues to white people by not having that exposure. Um, it's also true, certainly in healthcare, that we know that Black people get worse treatment in the healthcare system um, or less of needed interventions in the healthcare system. Well, it's also maybe true that white people get more of those, but more isn't always better in healthcare. So if we're talking about um, a CT scan, then that exposure to radiation particularly if, if they're being offered, if white people are being offered higher levels of this diagnostic procedure, that, that can be damaging. And so understanding the ways in which transfer of advantage or transfer of opportunity functions, not only to impact the health negatively of black and brown people, but to improve the health of white people is an important um, perspective that we should take. And then finally, I would ask, how do we study intersectionality? And we've been very interested in other methods that allow us to better understand um, how we hold various factors um, at the same time. And there are some intersectional research methods that have been of particular use and value to us. And so we call them configurational comparative methods. These are methods that are based in set theory and that use Boolean algebra and are aimed at understanding complex causation or so-called conjunctural causation. Uh, two such methods are qualitative comparative analysis developed by Charles Reagan in, in 1987 and more recently coincidence analysis developed by Michael Baumgartner in 2008. But the characteristics of these methods are that they focus on conjunctural causation. That is to say that single conditions may display their effect on an outcome only in combination with, and that in, by combination, we mean either the presence or absence of other conditions. Equifinality is the property that they're able to identify more than one causal pathway or so-called causal recipe to an outcome and causal asymmetry that the causal pathways to achieve the outcome are different from the pathways for to failing to achieve that outcome. There's a, there's a fascinating book that I highly recommend by Reagan and Fiss called Intersectional Inequality, where they engage, they undertake a reanalysis of the data that generated the book, The Bell Curve. And in this book, they offer an alternative to the conventional approach to the analysis of policy relevant social data. 
So instead of asking, what is the net effect of each independent variable, such as test scores versus family background, on the outcome of avoiding poverty, they ask what combinations of causally relevant conditions are linked to the outcome. So in their view, causal conditions do not compete with each other, rather they combine in different ways to produce the outcome. And so this alternative approach allows for the possibility there may be many paths to the same outcome and it doesn't force the incremental effect of each causal variable on the outcome to be the same for each case. And so we've applied this, for example, I think it's a profound perspective and their reanalysis, I think, really shines light on the defects in the original analysis uh, that generated the bell curve. But one example, we used the approach qualitative comparative analysis to look at help seeking among black male trauma survivors um, in Philadelphia. These are men who had suffered either intentional or unintentional injury. And without going too deep into the details, we identified three pathways or three causal recipes that uh, led to psychological help seeking among these men. And they included the presence of high levels of depression symptoms combined with the absence of financial worry. Um, there was one pathway that where traumatic symptoms themselves drove help seeking, but another pathway where in the absence of traumatic stress symptoms and in the presence of high financial worry, men were predisposed to seek help. And these recipes in a sense tell us that we can't view black men as monolithic in terms of how they are motivated to seek psychological care after injury. Another application has been, and this is preliminary ongoing work, but to look at what factors or combinations of factors are linked to higher rates of COVID infection in Philadelphia. And so using qualitative comparative analysis, we identified that, excuse me, that there were three causal recipes we could identify. The first is a high percentage of black population. And you see on, the, on this diagram that those marked with the red A were characterized, those zip codes were characterized by that causal condition. Um, but there was another causal condition that is high limited, high levels of limited English proficiency combined with the absence of a high proportion of people working in the service industry and without high poverty. And those are represented by the yellow B. So we see that there are different pathways to high COVID infections that may suggest different interventions uh, based on those characteristics. And we also saw that over time, there was emergence of other recipes. So in this case, two weeks later, high levels of public transportation use identified to other areas. And so I would suggest that there are methods that we can use. Many of them bridge qualitative and quantitative um, data strategies, um, which brings together different uh, opportunities to identify from people in communities what they believe the causes of health problems are that are related to race. And it also allows us to, uh, to tell a different story that we can capture the complexity of the ways in which racism plays out in conjunction with other factors at the community level. So thanks for the time. I look forward to more conversation about these ideas and that have been shared so far. Dr. Werler, you, you're muted. Thank you. Um, all right, so thank you for four really fantastic presentations, lots of um, interesting ideas and
thoughts. So they have spurred several questions in the Q&A box. Um, so I'm going to start at the top, which means that um, the first question, um, I believe, is directed to Dr. Hajat. Um, and uh, this relates to state health department uh, research and dealing with very small groups. So this particular person, the studies persons with developmental disabilities, but they um, also experience health inequities um, and wants to know how would you examine groups in that sort of state department surveillance scenario um, when you're confronted with small sample size? Yeah, I mean, it's not uh, necessarily an easy thing to do, right? There are challenges, specifically when we're trying to identify populations that might be a little bit harder to identify, right? So the identification of a uh, dis developmental disability it could be pretty broad, I would imagine, <clears throat> and uh, you know, encompass many different uh, types of things that we'd have to look at. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, really trying to use some of the resources that the state has to try in, in some ways to uh, both partner with uh, developmental uh, advocacy groups that really serve these populations to better figure out how to, um, you know, to get at this this sort of smaller population, I think would be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, a couple of other questions uh, were related to this um, small sample issue. And one thing you had mentioned is the possibility of combining groups. Um, and not blindly, of course. Um, and so that spurred a couple of questions. Um, one is, are there novel methods in this area of work that allow researchers to continue to disaggregate without needing to collapse? Yeah, and you know, many people who have studied or looked at this issue in, in detail have actually suggested that this is an area for methods development. Um, you know, we've done this a lot with small area estimation. So in some ways, this is a parallel question, right? It's not space, but people mm -hmm. over space. But so it's it feels like it's a good space to continue to think about uh, new and innovative methods to get at smaller populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, a few of you mentioned COVID-19 in your presentations. Um, this question has to do with um, grouping Hispanic and Black communities when referring to disparities in healthcare, like um, COVID infection rates. Um, it's always a bit misleading. There's historic racialization of Hispanic people in the US, but within the ethnic minority, there are Black, Asian, and white Latinos. How can we make sure these nuances are addressed in a responsible manner? Someone else want to take that too, that's fine. <laughs> but really, you know, in, on the COVID front, I will say a recent report uh, has shown that state health departments are not doing a great job with um, collecting race data when it comes to COVID. So there's really no way we can start to disaggregate if we don't even have the data in the first place. So really trying to uh, mandate or have some system for better collection of this data is critical for moving forward with the pandemic. Yeah, and if I could add to that, uh, it's not just surveillance data. I mean, obviously surveillance data is, is a huge start, but also um, EMRs and, and claims where, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, even in integrated healthcare systems, you know, there are some large data sets where, you know, the race variable is uh, imputed. Um, and, you know, um, so it's hard to really do measurement, um, you know, when, uh, you know, measuring race and ethnicity uh, is not really built into uh, systems in a standardized fashion. I, uh, so yeah, but I would agree. And I'll just add that in Canada, we are way behind on race measurement, um, woefully behind. But during the COVID-19 era, thanks to a lot of pressure from communities, academics and others, uh, the, the uh, powers that be in charge were forced uh, to start collecting this data and originally came out at, at, uh, at the outset and said something like, we don't need to collect this data, we care about everybody. And uh, quickly had to change when it was becoming clear that there were huge disparities and that there were large demands for the data. So it does work to put pressure on them. Um, there's a question here, can a change in our language 
help in our breakdown, help in breaking down the barrier of race. Can getting rid of the breakdown USA generally uses as an identifier help change our thoughts on race? So do we have a language problem um, that perhaps is um, driving some of the other uh, um, structural problems in terms of data collection that, um, that we struggle with? I don't know if we can get around that one. Um, here is a question directed to Dr. Siddiqui. Um, you mentioned journal expectations in reference to health disparities research, specifically the expectation of isolating effects of race as independent of factors that are likely mediators in the pathway between race and health. This is just one way in which journal expectations impact health inequality research. Do the presenters have ideas about how to shift, update, or retool the way our journals gatekeep disparities research? So that this is actually a question for everyone. I'm, I'm happy to take a stab at it. I think um, probably people like me need to serve more on, you know, um, you know boards and, uh, you know, do reviews, but I think uh, there's a lot, I think probably a lot starts with education. Um, you know, one of the things we discussed in, in our own epi department was the need to um, include equity and social epi as, you know, mandatory for, uh, you know, as, as, as part of the core, core coursework. Um, and I think that's right. You know, when you have uh, a lot of the people who become, you know, the, the editors and clinical journals are the people you see around you in grad school. They're the people getting the MPHs, they're people getting the masters. And they're very smart people and they're there to learn methods. And, and that foundation that they get is what they take with them. So I think, you know, um, you know now, nowadays you see more people requesting causal analyses and things like that. And that's because they've been exposed to these ideas in their graduate training. I think we have the same opportunity in our graduate training to really expose people to um, issues around equity. And um, I think it's just gonna be a work in progress, but I would start, I would really start start there, start with, uh, you know, making sure that it's, it's uh, part of a holistic uh, curriculum. And I will note too, there have been other calls. Um, I think someone also put this in the chat, but the article by Boyd and all in health affairs or the, it was a blog post, really sort of point to very specific things that journal editors, journal reviewers, and uh, you know, authors of papers can be doing um, to deal with both this sort of issue of um, you know, using racial essential essentialism, but also sort of thinking about methodologically, what are we doing when we're putting, you know, adjusting for mediators? Uh, and just to sort of emphasize what everyone else has said, I think, it starts also with very open dialogue within our field. We have to make uh, this, these issues be known so that there's pressure on editors. Certainly we need people doing uh, good work in this area to be editors, as uh, Dr. Jackson pointed out. Uh, you know, so I think there's a variety of things, but I think it will really um, depend on having a sort of open, honest reckoning with it. And I would just add that I think um, far too often we we see papers published where race is identified as a, a cause without any explanation about the conceptual frame that that's being used. What is the mechanism? And it's so um, it becomes almost background so that we accept it as as important. And so uh, part of it is that we I think have to be vocal when we see. Uh, papers appear in that way. And I know that perhaps feels outside of the scope of our day-to-day -day work, but until there's feedback to, and, and I thought that the paper that we referenced just now, the Boyd paper does that, gives pointed feedback. And I think we can use the criteria that are, that are offered there to hold the, the um, journal editors beat to the fire on this. I think also, um... From because this is actually really really closely to the stuff I'm working on right now, is I find sometimes uh, you know there are uh, different hypotheses you know that 
get kind of muddled. So, um, you know, I'm just going to assume that people are thinking about disparity. You know, um, there are adjustments you make to measure disparity, and then there are adjustments that you might make to, um, you know, explain or to identify targets. Then there's adjustments you make for confounding. And, um, you know, that's a really like subtle, complicated topic that, you know, is just going to take years to unpack. But um, I think we have to be clear about what our questions are and why we're adjusting in the first place and maybe separate out those, you know, connected questions and, and you know, address them one by one. A lot of times when you open up, you know, a journal, you'll see a table <laughs> and it'll say, you know, unadjusted model, partially adjusted and fully adjusted model. And it's up to you to kind of make sense what the authors meant. And, um, and, I, and I do want to say, you know, um, Arjuman's point about uh, journal editors is, um, you know, and, and also reviewers is uh, spot on. That's why I didn't put the author's names because um, I, you know, when I read their papers and, you know, like I, um, I saw that, you know, in the discussion, they, you know, the, the, um, the context was there. It's like they understood it, um, you know, but it was really, you know, I think just, it looks just like any other exposure or risk factor analysis you would do. So it's really baked into the culture of how we publish in, um, especially in, in uh, clinical medicine. Yeah, but it is a time for change. I, I have seen some um, journal changes um, with respect to um, in review forms, having the uh, reviewers and actually the author at the time of submission um, identify how race was collected um, how is it being conceptualized in um, this particular study? So I wonder if maybe this isn't a time when pressure could be put on journals to have something systematic. Training for all editors would be one thing, but you could certainly have um, a rubric that is part of journal reviews by, by peer reviewers and editors. There's one thing to, to sort of mention, it sort of puts a damper on this, on the spirit of this, but I think it's worth um, mentioning because it's, it's quite real. I find when I look at journals, um, particularly uh, journals that are more medical than, uh, and biomedical than they are public health, journals like uh, New England Journal of Medicine, for instance, um, they will one week have a very nice explanation, like a commentary that talks about how race is social, it's not biological, we need to be looking at structural racism. And in the next issue, and maybe even in the same issue, is, is a paper that treats race as biological. So I'm not quite sure what to do with that or, or what to make of it, but I think it's a, a real phenomenon that we have to uh, uh, contend with that there are a lot of uh, competing um, uh, ideas, but also competing schools of thought that are, I think, difficult um, to reconcile and that journals aren't really forcefully reconciling. So, uh, you know, make of that what you will, I guess. Yeah, I think that speaks to the lack of standardization, lack of training and um, standard review criteria across um, all the different domains within even a single journal like New England Journal. Okay. Um, well, the number of questions is skyrocketing. Um, here's one related to the current question, many other, and the current question, um, I think, yeah, I'm gonna skip that one. <laughs> This is very hard to, to process questions and, and uh, discussion at the same time. Um, we know that community research takes longer and more energy. My concern is that larger studies or clinical studies and such won't have to improve their approach to address inequities. Is putting pressure on these studies the best or only way for change? This I presume means the extant studies like you know the, the big cohorts um, that exist and generate a huge amount of um, associations that enter the mainstream. 
So, I mean, it is true that community engaged <coughs> research definitely takes more time, especially up front with the relationship building <coughs> in terms of the communities, but the payoff in the end could be really just so much greater. And I think, you know, something that we are starting to see is, um, you know, NIH starting to incentivize community-based participatory research. So we see this a lot in the environmental health side where there are, you know, specifically grants where it's a piece of that, right? So uh, that I think really helps. Um, and I really think to sort of get at some of the answers that we are not currently getting at that the community engaged research, even though it is more time consuming, potentially more costly, uh, is really needed. Um, okay, here's a question. We brown slash black folks experience founded trepidation when dealing with white researchers studying anything about us whether that's mental or medical health, personal experiences, et cetera. Do you find that white people going into black slash brown communities to collect epidemiologic data induce high anxiety in the communities? And if so, what can we do other than recruit and retain black and brown people in the field of epi who go into our communities? I, I would say, um, regardless of you know who goes into the community, it's about building a relationship um, and building trust. Um, you know, so both of the centers I, I mentioned do community engaged work, um, and I've been really honored to be a part of the community um, advisory board just really to, to listen. Um, you know, uh, the work that Lisa Cooper has done. Um, you know that that board has informed her trial. Um, and uh, there's regular feedback. Uh, it's 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 really deep and not just like the, a rubber stamp. I think the community uh, actually is more wary of the institution you come from, <laughs> rather than <laughs> the color of your skin, um, because you know they recognize that you know um, sometimes it's more about your economic position and what you stand to gain and benefit from the research. Um, you know that they're more worried about. Um, and so it really, you know, is about, you know, putting, uh, you know, a sustained commitment um, to developing relationships that will be there after the study and, and also giving back, um, finding ways to involve people to make sure that the community benefits from the research, either through training or, or also development and making some of the recommendations sustainable um, and, and some of the intervention resources sustainable. So I think it's about um, just doing really really engaged work. And I think anyone, any race um, can be problematic in the community. It's really about where your values are. Um, hearing you use the word values again, um, Dr. Jackson, I want to compliment you on your, um, your nice graphic of, um, of considering um, values and ethics um, and that this is something that we ought to um, consider upfront, that um, what do we consider fair? What do we consider not fair? Um, and sort of approach that with, with the same um, lens that we might give to um, uh, directed acyclic graphs and thinking about causal inference. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Um, that's really just a comment, but if it invites more from you, I'd be happy to hear it. No, I, I just, um, I, I'm glad it was well received because I was actually, when I was putting the talk to guys, like, oh my gosh, this should have been like on part one. And they're, they, you know, they're gonna like crucify me because it's part three and, you know, it's not the future, but it just seemed like what we need to be talking about. And, you know, I don't think there's gonna be like a universal answer to this. I just found it really insightful when I was, you know, working on it to really realize that I could look at things different ways. Um, and that really helped me understand where, you know, certain approaches were coming from and also how much, you know, some things in the literature are, are, are missing and how important these, these issues are. Uh, and I just, you know, I think in terms of solving disparities, it's like, we have to get that part right, you know, cause it's, 
if we're only tracking partial change, there could be like a huge gap that's like remaining. So, you know, I think we have to get these issues um, and really deal with them. Thank you. Dr. Rich, did you have something to add? Thank you. I, I did want to return to this issue about um, white researchers and in interacting with communities of color. And I, I do think from a clinical perspective, though we have lagged behind there, we have to acknowledge that we've all been socialized racially. That we, and, and so one approach to this is to take an inside out perspective. One is any researcher who's going to interact with a community um, has to take some assessment about how they feel about race, how what they were taught about race and how that influences their, the way they've conceptualized the question, the way they've developed the methods, what they think partnership with community looks like. Because there is, I would argue, very little ability to be objective with regard to issues of race and that racism being, structural racism being so prominent, it's hard to imagine that it doesn't seep into the work in many ways. So earlier what I was talking about is there's, there's advantage that all of us have, who have some privileged identity have conferred. So if we're white, we've conferred the privilege of whiteness. If as a man, I have, con I have, I have the privilege of maleness, but if I haven't accounted for that, and I have, particularly if I have this sort of um, notion that objectivity is easy to achieve, uh, then I think there's great potential for harm. So I, I think that's the point, how do we do the work that's necessary in the same way that a clinician ought to do the work to make sure that in their interaction with patients or clients or communities, they're not doing harm because of unaccounted for biases um, or perspectives that are deeply embedded and unaware. And you know, the, I like the, um, I think that the implicit association test is a, is a very nice first step to that, but it is far from an adequate way to interrogate one's own racial socialization. Just to add to that, I think, you know, those comments are really about researcher positionality. And again, in qualitative research, uh, researchers often will state their positionality up front, who you are, where you're coming from, what your views are. This is not something we talk about in EPI, uh, and maybe there's a place for that, uh, is what I would suggest. Um, we've had a few questions uh, having to do with measuring race um, in different settings, like um, in surveillance, health departments, um, in um, claims scenarios, health claim scenarios. Um, but here is a nice, simple question. Um, what would you imagine is included in a minimal package of questions slash data points tracing race in epidemiologic studies, e.g. the race and epidemiology starter pack. Do you mean um, survey questions? Well, I think that this could be applied in a lot of ways. Um, I, I think it, it starts um, with survey questions. You would have to um, collect the data, but um, it could be extended to assuming that you have a huge amount of data, what would your starter pack be for um, analyzing those data? Or conceptualizing, really? I mean, I think for me, um, I would first want to know what the extent of the disparities are. And uh, as people have mentioned, there's sort of different ways to tackle that question. So uh, rather than a starter pack of questions, I might offer a starter pack of at least um, ideas or areas to pursue. So one is, um, you know, measurement of the extent of inequity and being thoughtful about how that's being measured. Um, the second is to look for ways to capture uh, the primary mechanisms that go between race and health, meaning the social to biological uh, uh, pathways. And again, 
being thoughtful about that. And the third would be to look for ways to measure the structural conditions that produced this. Um, and so instead of relying just on um, the race variable to do the work of suggesting structure, which it does, by the way, I mean, it, it is entirely true that if there are racial inequities, that means there are structural inequities. Um, but trying to figure out how that might be further specified either by um, geographic um, uh, variables that are included in the data. So if there's anything related to geography or anything related that can be linked to um, other sources of data that offer structural variables, that's a good place to start. But I think as a group, as a sort of notion, uh, it would be to be thoughtful about how and, and creative, frankly, about how we might um, pursue questions about the structural conditions that are affecting inequities. And I think I just add that I think it also depends, really. I don't know if there's a one size fits all, right? I don't know if there is a starter pack, really, uh, in that it's going to depend on your study population. It's going to depend on your question, on your outcome, on your study design. So, you know, I think, and to the degree to which we've really explored some of the different measurements of race itself, uh, which I don't feel like that's been done sufficiently in the epi literature, you know, I think it's still a little bit of an unknown as to uh, how best to proceed. Um, I had a question. I, I, I feel like much, much of what we've been talking about is, um, sort of presuming that we're, we're dealing with observational data, um, but there have been some um, comments related to interventions, um, trying to understand um, what we can change in the pathway between racism and um, health outcomes. And our gold standard in epidemiology is randomized controlled trials. And I'm curious if any of you have an opinion on um, that study design and whether it's needed to really um, affect change for studying interventions. Um, I, I think, uh, yes, yes, if we could, Random. I, well, I think we we could think about ways to uh, randomize some things, right? So, like policy interventions could be, you know, have a staggered rollout that's that's randomized. You know, there are opportunities sometimes that we have to do that. Um, but you know, a lot of times, at least from what I've observed in um, the implementation science literature, which is really fascinating, they're the ones who are really working on a lot of um, innovative methods for um, intervention. A lot of it's, you know, quasi-experimental, um, and you know, it just is. It is what it is. It's very messy. You can't, a lot of times, randomize these things. You have to go in maybe years beforehand, and you know, engage with stakeholders and train. And there's, there's just, it's just a different model. I don't, I don't, you know, I think that's a gold standard we can hold to. But, you know, I'm not sure that that's going to be the design that's always used for, you know, large-scale interventions. So we, we have to find ways to emulate that or to approximate it as best as possible. I would just add to that um, that I, I very much agree. Uh, there's a lot that probably would be the most, would have the most impact that is probably not amenable to a randomized trial. So for instance, if the fundamental issues are about income, wealth, power, those are, are hardly things that we can ethically uh, or logistically randomize. Um, Quasi-experiments do offer a, a sort of more doable and arguably sort of applied perspective on intervention. So they sort of assess what we're doing. My worry is that in an era where we've seen social policies that largely have gone in the wrong direction, that largely are about taking away resources. We're in an era of increasing income inequality, declining uh, welfare states and social assistance, that then what ends up happening is we're essentially um, assessing and analyzing bad interventions. We're, we're often 
you know, showing how bad it is, for example, to have had mid 1990s welfare reform that stripped so much uh, from the poor. So it, I worry that it limits our imagination about interventions. And when we stick to things that we can do or have been done, uh, either through randomization or quasi uh, experimental designs. I, I completely agree. Uh, so when I when I was saying quasi experiment, what I mean is sort of like, you know, doing your intervention, but realizing that, you know, you need, you know, a control series, or, you know, some way to account for bias, but I, I, I am totally with you that limiting yourself to what's been done in the world is uh, not the way that we're going to solve this thing. And, and conversely, I agree with you. I think quasi experiments are, are very important to see what the effects are of what has been done. And I, I think we can also begin to think as some do in dissemination implementation research about what works for who and under what conditions so that we can this is again part of this maybe even research like some of these configurational methods that choose people based on the dependent outcome, the dependent variable, and try and understand what are the pathways to success, realizing that we, we have to often, because of the complexity of issues, the one size fits all um, may get us in trouble. So can we identify pathways and can we then use that to um, account for we, because we can use these methods both to look at what are the pathways to success and the pathways to non-success. And so we have a, a different kind of data that may lend itself to future larger um, studies, but there's a tremendous amount of um, case knowledge that can be leveraged to better understand um, how to implement effective interventions. Yeah. Um... Sorry to bring up um, former uh, administrations in the United States, but um, many of you, if not all of you, brought up issues related to white supremacy and white privilege and structural racism and um, who benefits from, from the, uh, the structures that we have in place right now. Um, and then we, we have at the same time the political um, scenario with close to half the, the country um, voting in favor of someone who I don't think we can put in the category of even microaggressions. Um, and so I, I wonder if um, perhaps applying something like um, an intervention on um, understanding race, racism um, in certain parts of the population and, and perhaps applying um, to observational data, um, the uh, intersectional research method approaches that you mentioned, Dr. Rich, um, that we might be able to move, move attitudes a little bit that could have perhaps profound impacts on health in the, the next generation. Just a thought. Okay, it is 1.59 and let's see, I've got my chat box in front. So, oh, there he is. Um, Dean Galea is back and that means it's time for us to finish up and hear some closing words. Well, uh, first, of, first of all, thank you, Dr. Werler for um, sharing. And thank you to uh, Dr. Siddiqui Hajat, uh, Jackson and Rich. That was a really, Amazing session. Uh, I want to say thank you to all the uh, audience. We've had about uh, 2,500 people um, uh, participate in this symposium at uh, some point in the past day and a half, which surely must be some sort of large number of people to talk about epidemiology and race at uh, any one time. So I'm deeply grateful to you all. I'm deeply grateful to everybody for being part of this conversation. It, it is um, the privilege of these events is I get to learn so much in such a short period of time, and I get to learn from uh, people whose work I've admired for a long time and who, with whom I've had the privilege of interacting. So I want to say thank you. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everybody who facilitated. And um, mostly uh, thank you to the community to uh, actually think to everybody out there who's taken the time to be a part of this conversation. I, one thing that always happens with good events like this is that you finish with more questions than what you started with. So I'm not sure I solved many things in my head, but I have a lot more questions now and hopefully I have better questions. And that's thanks to you all, not just to the um, speakers, but to everybody in the audience. So I want to say to everybody, thank you for 
using this moment in time so that we can learn together collectively to do ever better by what we do. Everybody, have a wonderful afternoon and have a restful weekend. Thank you for joining us.